Booyah. What financial celebrity says that? Booyah. Good turnaround Tuesday, everyone. How you doing, Hugo, Richard, Raj, Jays, what's going on? Shalom, Ingmar. Everyone doing okay? CPI, big the big deal? I'm fine. Okay. So we're getting some pressure ahead of the number on. There, there you go. Hi, Barry. Yes, Yom Kippur coming out, uh, coming up Thursday. Going to ask Blake if I could celebrate that solemn day. All right, so, you know, we had a rally attempt. Yes, I thought yesterday was pretty good uh, follow through in the S&Ps, even though we recovered. Um, we had a nice sell off from early morning strength up here. And NASDAQ failed where it had to, right up here. Prior support, I talked about yesterday, becomes new resistance. I don't see it doing anything real right yet. Um, I think this is the whole market, guys. And they're having a dog and pony show today. So um, maybe it'll get a lift, but check this out. Okay, so that's a wedge line on Apple. You know, it's Wiley Coyote on the cliff. There's a big picture. Would you want to be long a, a chart like this? Forget what the title of the chart is. Largest market cap in the cosmos. And they're going to show off some new Jays, you own a million shares. I just transferred them <laughs> over to you. Now pay me. All right, anyway, so so goes Apple, just like the apple that fell from the tree. So will go the market in my, oh yeah, the, I think the watch already, yeah. Everyone buy a watch. Okay, enough of apple. It's got a worm in it as far as I'm concerned. Don't eat this apple. Stay in the Garden of Eden. So what could happen here in currencies? If we get a strong number, I was kind of looking at this little short-term formation here. You know, uh, we have confluence at the 17 and a half level for, you know, where you would have uh, symmetry for a right shoulder compared to the left down here. Hi, Paul. How are you? Gosh, uh, I'm. I have. I'm having uh, old timers disease. I'm trying to remember you. Anyway, refresh my memory. Uh, Japanese yen, if we get a, a number, maybe it'll finally push. Oh, that's right. Hiya, Paul. That's right. Gosh. And we just met. 10-year trying. So I think a lot of things boil down to the number. And then I was looking at Dixie. And what was it? Maybe we get one more push if we have a stronger than expected number. The market thinks that we're going to get a soft number. So it's set up for maybe a surprise for one more shot up here in the dollar. So not a lot of positions going in, but um, I believe that we held the wedge line or the uptrend in the S&Ps yesterday. Look at that. And that 50-day moving average is something... I saw on CNBC, it's really worked fairly well. So I, I think a lot of people are going to be uh, paying attention to that trend line. And it lines up with Blake's um, wedge line, pretty close to it. Probably uh, uh, when Blake is on, maybe it'll, it touched it yesterday when it sold off a little bit and then recovered. So it, sure uh, did. Just, uh, so it did a tag it, buddy. 
Yep, it sure did. We'll look at okay. it here in a minute. Go ahead. Continue. Oh, okay. On. All right. So anyway, uh, I have to keep going. Bush. Bushdale. Remember that, Blake, when you used to have a dog sled anyway? Yeah, <laughs> mule. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, the crude looks like it, it's breaking out, but is it really? It kind of doesn't go with like a de-risking thing. And you know what China is doing, guys? Off the 20? Okay. They're deleveraging. I mean, I don't know. It's like they want to... Um, it's a big deal, I think, that the market's not, you know, is starting to pay attention to how they're not bailing out certain uh, companies after they were so easy for so long and then got re, uh, very restrictive and they want lower commodity prices. Um, uh, they're trying to step on the markets here, I think. Um, so uh, you can't have it both ways where it's an engine of growth uh, when it's growing, and if it's an engine of, you know, draconian financial measures, um, that's going to have an impact on us eventually, I think. Don't you, Blake? What I'm the sorry, Chinese the draconian are doing, measures about uh, on what? On, what I'm China's sorry. been doing, deleveraging, de um, they've decided not to bail out some companies, uh, what they've done with a lot of their tech companies, you know, Jack Ma and the confiscation, and now it's very unpopular to show your riches there. I mean, they're really cracking down on financial freedoms. Uh, there. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know how that's going to affect us here. I, I'm, Growth. I'm they, if they, you know, I, I don't think uh, the world could have it both ways and call China an engine of growth that's going to lift the rest of the world or participate with it. And then when they're contracting, um, be able to ignore it. Yeah, I do believe that the China slowdown is a real phenomenon that we're going to be dealing with. I, you know, so I guess that I, 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 I misinterpreted you. I, yeah. Okay. I, I think that it's going to uh, the China slowdown is going to affect us um, in mentality, uh, the psychology, psychology markets. Yeah. yeah, I think that's yeah. where it's that that's what's going to weigh on it most. I mean, you know, we have a lot of headwinds that we're dealing with just in general. I mean, you know, you 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 take today's inflation data. I mean, you know, there's there's arguments, and matter of fact, if you guys heard uh, Eric from. Um, uh, EPB research that I did an interview with the, the other day was talking about like inf inflation data is, you know, may have peaked here. Um, and, and I think that's like the, the, the general theme that, that we've got to be thinking. And so if you see like, you know, um, inflation come down a little bit today, it, it's probably going to keep a little bit of a bid in the, the stock market, but we've, we've got a lot of headwinds between, between that the risk of taxes going up, uh, you know, I think that, you know, we're, we're, we're heading into, you know, September, which is a, you know, historically kind of tough month for, for the markets, because, you know, you get the, uh, the if you're going to get a sell-off or any type of pullback in risk assets, it's going to be the September, October, November timeframe before, you know, you get a risk rally into, uh, into the holidays. So, I mean, we're, we're faced with a, like a lot of near-term risks, I think in the market, um, you know, and then on top of that, you throw in a China potential slowdown too. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, I, I, I would, I'd be careful with the markets here. So. Hey buddy, what are you thinking currency wise here? You know, um, well, well, first of all, I, 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 I have to say that in, in the currency market, it's been pretty quiet and let me, uh, grab, the computer okay. real charts really quick. We don't have Ryan today. Um, if good morning, you guys were, Stel. I know Stell's around. I don't, good morning. I don't care good about that Stellios guy. Oh, God, oh, he's, he's here. here. Hey, hey Stell. <laughs> <laughs> good morning, Stellios. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. I guess it's nice and quiet around your house. You don't have your kids. Your 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 girls running around. Nice. It's lovely. Yes. <laughs> you can actually focus. You can focus now, bro. Yes, indeed. Well. I was going to say, well, we, you know, it's, it's nice. Uh, I know you and both you and Steve have your, uh, having the kids out of the house is, is nice. You know, for, 
people people um, make a big deal out of it that that n- normally you know I think during the the COVID um, last year and a half is really weighed on people. They're like, thank God my kids are out of out of the house. But you know, for those of us that we we have been for years and years and years trading and working from home uh, before COVID was even around. Um, we're, you know, we're kind of used to it, right? It's like, uh, it's like, I don't mind when my kids are around, it doesn't bother me, but I know it weighs on a lot of people. Yeah, I find it hard to get a work done when I, when the kids are around just asking about yeah. stuff. Anyway, yeah. it is what it yeah. is, yeah. Yeah, uh, so so we don't have Ryan here today, but speaking of kids, he had one of his, uh, one of his uh, sons uh, had a little bit of a tooth issue. So he had to, he had to run off uh, to the dentist um, so we're not going to have Ryan here today. So for those of you that were expecting um, the Jason straight, how do you say his last name? Statham. Statham. Uh, Statham. Uh, that, that's him. Uh, sound alike. <laughs> um, he's not going to be here today, unfortunately. So, uh, so Ryan's not here. Um, what, what are your, what are your thoughts about overnight price action? What's happened overnight? Wait, wait, wait before you get into that, uh, Dale was asking me about, about the, um, about about currencies really quick. I want to point up uh, p- point up pull up one currency that you know I've I've actually I have a little slice long of the U.S. dollar South African rand uh, last week as we made this little false breakdown. And at the end of last week, I picked up a little bit, um, you know, in the teens here, and you know it's starting to peak its head up. But the reason why I did is because we had a 618 retracement, false little breakdown. Look at this move. And, and I want to just show you like on an hourly basis. Um, and now I'm going to be running into some issues today because, you know, it, it is or not today, tomorrow. And I never really thought much about this when, you know, I traded in size because when I trade in size, and I trade some of these like, uh, uh, emerging market currencies. I was in and out of them pretty quick, and I didn't see the rollover costs, even though I'd see them at the end of the month. Um, I'd see, you know, during my look at my brokerage statements when I from J.P. Morgan and some of the rollover costs. I'd be like, oh, but you know, day to day, I actually see them on my retail platform now that I don't trade with you know J.P. Morgan. And so um, the reason why I'm telling you that is because I I, I don't know if I'll be holding this going into tomorrow. Uh, when I get um, massive rollover charges, but I want to show you that you know the hourly RSIs have been really divergent, and you can see that we've really started to base here, and we're you know we've we've had a hell of a move lower, and if we see any type of risk off, um, you know to get a now that was a eight percent move to, just to retest those highs would be eight percent from here. I'm not thinking that right now, but I'm thinking a recovery rally, you know, which could be two, three percent higher in the U.S. dollar South African rand, especially if we break above the uh, the the 1426 level. I think it's something that you guys should be paying attention to because this one could get up and move. These uh, I, I do like to trade some of the emerging market currencies like the the dollar max, um, the dollar rand. Um, these are ones that I, I try to take advantage of, especially if I think there's going to be a little bit of risk aversion coming into the market. So just keep your eye on the, uh, the RAND. Um, it's one that I think that, that could be played, especially on this little false breakdown and respect of the 618 retracement as we head into uh, this week. So anyway, still, sorry, I, I wanted to say that really quick no before you, you prepped, up with, prepped us with the overnight price action. So what's been hope, happening overnight? I know we got some employment data out of the UK um anything else uh, that you that you've seen uh well you're right average earnings uh, out of uk 8.3 percent year on year so that's uh not a bad number um so we, this goes back to what we we're talking about yesterday that it's not just inflation that we're seeing in terms of asset a sort of a cpi and all that but we're seeing this in um in earnings as well um the the event today obviously is a cpi out of the us now, yeah. what, what I wrote in the chat room, and um, my view is that inflation is here to stay and it's going to be high and probably rising more uh, going into next year. Um, however, 
this time, you know, on this number today, it feels like the whole market is expecting a big beat. I mean, everybody I speak to or, or read, uh, they're all going, oh my God, this is going to be close to 5%. And, and uh, sorry, um, core CPI close to 5%, CPI year on year, maybe close to 6%, whatever. I, you know, as with all these things, nothing goes in a straight line. It feels like they, you know, eventually there's going to be some kind of disappointment, even just for one print, right? We've had prints that just go up, up, up all the time. At some point, there's going to be disappointment. So even though I think that inflation is here to stay and is going higher, I think that for today, um, the risk for me is that we get a slight disappointment in uh, in the reading and then uh, the market gets caught one way and, you know. And, yeah, well, well, guess what happens if we have a reading that comes in a little below expectations? Yeah, well, there's there's going to be well, metals are going to do well. Uh, the yen is going to move. Yields are going to move. Um, I think stocks rally. Stocks, stocks rally off support exactly. Yeah. Um, and you know, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine yesterday, and he was saying, you know, what do you think about stocks, um, U.S. stocks in particular, but global stocks? I said, look, for the past ten years, really, the main driver for stocks has been uh, low rates. QE and just um, you know um, the, the the total mispricing of risk. So I I told them that I think stocks are only going to um, turn around when um, the punch ball gets taken away. How long will it get taken away for, or to what degree? It doesn't matter. But uh, but that's when we're going to see stocks properly retreating, which means yields are going to be rising. You know the Fed is going to tell us, look, we're we're tapering by a decent amount or we're going to be hiking that's when the market i think is going to you know crap its pants and um, and move lower how much lower i don't know but i think you know a 20 25% correction is is more than healthy in equities but unless and uh, sorry until we get to that point I don't think stocks are going anywhere apart from a slow grind higher. And that's why I think inflation is very important because really this is the thing that's going to be driving um, central banks and the Fed in particular. Um, as long as inflation keeps rising and it's it's relatively high, uh, they're going to have to act. You know, yeah. To what degree, it doesn't matter, but they're going to have to act. And that's what the market will fear, at least in the short term. And we're going to have a, co- uh, not probably not like a COVID-like move, but we're going to have a nice little dip um, there's going to be dip buyers. They're going to get, uh, you know, their asses handed to them, and then we're going to dip a bit more, and then we're going to recover. So, um, so that's what I think. I think today's CPI, the risk is that we get um, uh, a softer than expected reading, uh, but overall, I think inflation is going to be high, and it's going to be higher than expected for, you know, at least going into next year. All right. Well, let's let's you know also keep in mind that, and and I'm going to reiterate if. if the data is a little soft today. We should get a rally in equities. Um, I think people are bracing for the worst. As Stelio said, everybody's talking about, you know, uh, you know, uh, like, like, you know, you're looking at year over year. I mean, you know, if we get a 5% uh, read, I mean, that would be really, and I was just, I just had the chart up from, you know, investing.com. So you can actually see what, you know, a 5% read would be obviously well above expectations at this point. Uh, even though the market's looking for what four point two percent, the but the 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 fact of the matter is is that um, the market's bracing for higher data, and yeah, if we do get a beat today, if we do have uh, uh, you know higher inflation, stocks may get hit. You know they might they might come under a little bit of pressure. Now Dale asked about that trend line. Yeah, we tagged that trend line yesterday, um, and if you. If for those of you that um, don't know, you know we we have the uh, the, the broadcast for our Forex Analytics subscribers every day that we do r- right after this this webinar, well right after Dale's interview, um, in less than an hour from right now we do the uh, the Morning Edge where the Morning Edge we cover all the instruments and you know the S and P support was forty four fifty it's huge um, it was huge yesterday we got to let's see what's the low uh there 44 45 just kind of pro below it but you guys can see this is the wedge that's been in existence since the well you know since we we can see the lows back in october of last year so you're talking about a an ascending wedge that's been in development since you know 11 months ago and everybody's looking at it. I mean, if you're just now tuning in for the very first time to today's well webinar, welcome. 
glad glad you could make it. But if this is the first time you've seen this chart, then you might be the only one because everybody else is looking at this chart too. We've been looking at it for for months, and you know now everybody knows the very very important low problem with everybody focused on this chart is twofold. Um, you know, a everybody knows about it, so b any breakdown might not be so significant. Um, unless it's for a reason, right? If, unless there's, there's for a reason. And, and you guys might recall from a few uh, weeks ago when we did this little breakdown below the support and it did, it tested the, the wedge or actually, you know, it actually, it did a little bit of a false breakdown because we did this. Okay. We, we broke it like that and then did a false breakdown for the day and then we reversed. So now we're going to be marking up the, uh, the 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 tips, if you will, of those of those uh, of those moves lower. So you can see it is very important here. So as long as we hold this week's lows, I wouldn't be getting too short, quote unquote, risk at this point. You know, and um, and and that's what that's the way I'm looking at it going into today's data. Now let's cover just a couple of currencies really fast. I, you probably saw the sterling that was up here. Um, you know, we've been pretty range bound in the sterling. You know, the 139 levels cap, the 137 and a quarter levels, you know, is where we find support. I, you you might have saw it a little earlier if you were tuned in before I deleted everything. Um, I think Stelios was talking when I when I started deleting this. This is a pretty simple setup here. You got a, a bullish wedge, but a break below 138 and a quarter targets the you know 137 and a quarter level again. So you got a about a you know. You could squeeze 60, 70 pips out of here, in my opinion, by the time you, you, you got in and got out, if you just want to play inside that range. But we also have the, the risk of a, a break above 139 will take us right back to 140. And 140 is going to be a pretty big resistance for the, uh, for the pair as well. So um, just keep in mind that, you know, we have a couple options here with the sterling and, and we did have some decent um, employment data out of uh, out of the UK overnight. So that's something to think about. Now, also, I want to mention that um, the Aussie dollar, this was my chart of the day yesterday. And the one thing that I have to keep in mind with the Aussie is that while we're above this 38% retracing, you can see that we're just kind of probing it. And in Europe, we, we just kind of, you know, might have might have gotten a few people short here. Because you have, you have to imagine this, this little red candle, that was more red a couple hours ago or maybe an hour ago, right? I mean, so it looked more deceivingly bearish an hour ago. And so you imagine all the people that just kind of got short on that. They're like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to sell my Aussies. I'm going to get short, whatever the case is. Oh, I'm going to target, you know, 172.90. The 50% retracement, that's a break. You know, we're going to go ahead and get short. Well, this is a bull flag pattern right now. And you have to pay pretty close attention to it because, um, you know, as a bull flag pattern, if, if equities are going to hold that 4450 level and head back to, you know, head back to uh, 4500 in the S&P, that may be what gooses the, uh, the Aussie you know, back above the 74 cent level. So just keep in, keep in mind the Aussie is set up for a bull flag. I'm not, and I don't have any Aussie exposure. This is something that I'm obviously just keeping an eye on because I'm more concerned about risk aversion and risk appetite. So obviously if, if the Aussie starts breaking, you know, down towards the uh, 72, 80 level, to me, that suggests that the S and P is probably ready to break forty four fifty, and we're going to see a much bigger correction in the S and P. The flip side to that is, is if we if we break back above seventy four cents, then you know I'm going to be very reluctant to be bearish risk, and I think that the S and P, like I said, is heading back to forty five hundred and maybe even all time highs. So keep that in mind. Uh, another thing Blake, that we we have to talk well, about uh, Norway as well. Oh yeah, what's uh, what's tell yeah. tell me about Norway? I mean, we you know yeah. we're, we're range bound. The the you know the Krone isn't doing anything, and you know we're we're trading between that eight sixty and eight 
73. But yes. yeah, we're, we're past the election. What's happening? Now? Yes. So basically, the uh, the Labour Party, so the um, uh, how would you say it? The uh, they were not in power before, so basically they are uh, they are now they've won and um, they're looking to form a coalition. Um, and you know these guys, they were talking about oh how Norway has to get off the um, the whole oil uh, industry uh, for uh, you know the cl- the um, climate and all that. And um, uh, but then uh, it it kind of um, everybody now is talking about how. Uh, I think around 5% of Norwegian population is involved in a, um, the petroleum industry in some in some way. So it's not something you can do from one day to the, to the next. It's going to be a, a long-term plan, you know, a decade or two. Uh, so this is not something that, uh, yeah, climate and all that. Yeah, exactly. Um, so it's not something that's going to, they're going to flip a switch and we're going to be off oil uh, from one day to the next. So yes, there's a new government who have, uh, they have different plans uh, but it's not like um, things are going to change overnight. So the corona is doing nothing. If anything, it's actually strengthening a little bit. But overall, it's um, uh, it's uh, behaving pretty well. Sell Norway, buy NFTs. That's all I have to say. <laughs> that's it. That's 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 the trade of the decade. S- sell sell the actual oil and buy <laughs> NFTs of oil. <laughs> that's it. That's right. We're going to buy NFTs of oil paintings. Not even oil. Just yeah, you, did you see that oil. thing with uh, Steve Jobs' first interview, uh, first uh, job uh, application? Did you see that? No, I didn't. There's a piece of paper where it's his first ever job application. It's it's already changed hands look, a few times in auctions, and it was up for auction. The actual paper and also an NFT of the paper, whatever that wow. means. And the paper got sold for like four hundred thousand dollars. Makes sense. And the NFT, I think, got sold for something like forty thousand. And I'm like, okay, you who bought the NFT, tell me what you bought. You know, I want to well, know. <laughs> well, you bought the you bought the only one digital image of that piece of paper. So yeah, but there are a like, million digital images on the internet of that paper. Exactly. <laughs> anyway, you know, but, I, I don't get you it. You have the original digital image. But you don't have the original piece of paper. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, but but I have much. the original digital image that is of the original paper. So yeah, uh, you know, I, I okay. Anyway, yeah, whatever. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we can all talk about it. But uh speaking of speaking of which, let's talk a little bit crypto really fast. And I think I heard Steve's voice in there. Um Steve, what's going on? Good. How have you been? Good. Good. Okay. So there was this news uh, on Litecoin yesterday. Well not news. It was like fake news. Uh, Litecoin spiked up, took the um, you know crypto market with it. You can see Ethereum ripped up, then came back down. Uh, it was obviously fake news. Bitcoin did, and and we have some pretty important levels. You know, uh, forty three thousand with Bitcoin, um, three thousand with Ethereum. That's what we should be looking at. Well, those are you know, in my I will argue bull bear lines for the uh, for those crypto markets right now, and it's really based on last week's price action. And um, I'm sorry, I just realized we have two minutes before the inflation data. So Steve, really quick, uh, as we go to, um, I'm going to pull up today, I'm going to pull up the Euro dollar, um, you know, and we're just going to keep it on a, on a five minute chart for the Euro uh, as I pull up the inflation data. But really quick, uh, Steve, how do you feel about the inflation picture uh, with the inflation data coming out, anything that you have, any expectations that you have? Um, the data can be volatile on a month-to-month basis, but if you look at them, both CPI and PPI, all year long, there is absolutely zero evidence that whatever we're seeing is transitory. Zero. We haven't seen a spike and a slow uh, slowdown following that. We haven't seen something short term with any type of indication. For example, we haven't seen CPI spike, PPI spike, and now PPI deflating. So we can start hoping that, you know, that's a leading indication that CPI is going to inflate anything. And everything that we've seen so far indicate that that inflation is a huge problem. And given the fact that there are no measures taken to fight it, and the only thing that central banks are doing is are denying that there is an actual problem, in my opinion, guarantees that the problem is going to um, become bigger, and you, sh- you should write a doom, gloom, and boom report, man. Dude, I'm I'm, I'm <laughs> telling you, you, you you're gonna you're taking over Mark Faber's old uh, gig. <laughs> oh, <thank you. laughs> 
He's right, though, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, okay, I mean, so, look, te- it, yeah, I, 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 do, I do agree. I mean, you know, obviously inflation, inflation pressures, we're going to we'll, we'll soon find out how real they are. But uh, today, like I said, oh, here it is. Two, Let's see. two minutes, two seconds. Here we go. Wow. Data is weak. Well, I told you. Yep. Stocks are line. ripping. Look at that. Stocks are flying. Well, so if the, if the inflation comes in weaker, you know, we're, we got a 4% print stocks are going to like it. Dollars going to weaken. And that's what we're getting. So we'll take a look at the spoos here, uh, rallying off of support. Um, actually I should probably put it on the hourly chart here. You can see that the, uh, the S and P is coming right off of support. Uh, dollar is weakening. You got the Aussie that's, you know, creaming back up towards uh, resistance. U.S. dollar Norwegian Krona has broken through support. Uh, dollar Canadian should be breaking. Oh, here we go towards triangle support. That might be a, a nice little breakdown here today. So inflation is weak. Assets. Mm-hmm. And and and, and um, I, I, I think. Uh, Good call, Stel. <laughs> I get lucky I think, sometimes. You're like Nostradamus. <laughs> And one of the reasons why the people are playing a lot of the long side today in stocks and, you know, they got a favorable, not so hot print is today's Apple day. Yeah. Yeah. Today is a, uh, today's Apple day. So, all right, guys. Um, hey, I, I want to say thank you to our webinar sponsors. That's Forest Park FX uh, and Pepperstone Securities. Forest Park FX is if you, if you're not, you know, getting cash back rebates or you're not, uh, you know, trying to trying to get in our reimbursement program so you can get Forex analytics potentially for free. Make sure you reach out to these guys. Um, we've been working with them for years. They they've obviously been our web- webinar sponsor for about five years, four or five years now. Um, make sure you contact them on Skype or you can send them an email. You can find their information right at the bottom of our website. Uh, I want to thank you guys and gals for being here. For those of you that are Forex analytics subscribers, we'll see you on the fa- or on the uh, morning edge in approximately um 45 minutes so see you there your razor bring your razor traders thanks guys thanks everybody okay john navin really a pleasure to meet you i'm uh very nice to of you to take some time out to talk to our community today john appreciate it let's see how do i start this (laughs) well you it's see it started so i I'm not sure if you wanted to share your screen. Did you bring anything you wanted to show? I could share mine. Or well, there okay. you are. I see. Oh, okay. okay. Hi, John. All right. Let me, I'll turn my uh, camera on too, and we'll we'll do one of these interviews. So, John, very nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I appreciate you taking some time today. So, uh, John contributes to Forbes. Uh, why don't you tell us about? Uh, your road to becoming a financial journalist and, um, you know, what you do now. And, you know, I actually, um, I am going to share the screen a bit to, uh, cause I, I want to just show some of the articles that John's written right here. Oh my God. Okay. So I wrote you know, all that, huh? Yeah. It, I mean, you're following the whole gamut here, John. So, you know, you're covering crypto and everything. And, you know, just from your headlines, um, and I know you you don't give in, investment advice, but I've, I bet uh, you're like me and you've seen a few cycles. Yeah. Uh, what's your vibe about what's going on here? We got a, you know, the market liked uh, the fact that we, you know, didn't have a hot number today on the CPI. Um, have you ever seen a, an era of speculation like we have today i mean with sure things. uh yeah. a couple of times late 1999 leading into okay. uh, the end of the tech stock boom okay um just to give you the background dale that was the uh the year 2000 i entered the online stock trading competition called marketocracy okay. uh, it's, it's come and gone since then um but they they gave you a uh, million dollars of virtual money And you had to uh, put together a portfolio based on standard mutual fund practices. Sounds like what the Fed does. 
Yeah, you had to uh, diversify <laughs> 20 different stocks at least. You No single stock could be more than 25% of the portfolio. You could never be more than 35% in cash and uh, so on and so forth. Um, at the end of the first year, uh, I, d- I did well enough that they invited me to uh, become a member of their Masters 100 fund. They called it wow. the M100. That was real money. Uh, And they started paying me. Uh, And then by 2010, I placed in the top 10 out of 80,000 participants in marketocracy. Uh, So the investments editor at Forbes uh, gave me a call, said he was writing a book about the uh, Masters 100 fund with marketocracy. And would I be, uh, could he interview me? I said, sure. So I ended up in this book, Dell. The book is called The Warren Buffett's Next Door, The World's Greatest Investors You've Never Heard Of. I've Um, heard of the book, the title. Yeah, I'm not Warren Buffett. I'm not one of the world's great investors. Um, The performance by 2011, 2012 had fallen off a bit. Uh, Matt asked me if I wanted to write a blog for Forbes uh, because I had some news writing background. And uh, I've been doing it since then. Uh, okay. he let, they let me write about anything I want to write about, but I stick mainly to stocks and stock markets. Okay. So, uh, you know, I, I think that a lot of us at times uh, reach a crossroads in our career because, you know, John, I really do believe that uh, trading is really a young man's game. I, yeah. I don't, I, I've noticed that um, I don't handle the pressure the same way I do. So I don't put as much pressure on myself as far as leveraging up and so forth. But, uh, uh, you know, I've never been to a retirement dinner for a trader. Have you? No, (laughs) never. So, uh, you know, I'm wondering, uh, what was it that uh, led you to, because obviously you had skills, you won contests, uh, you traded real money. You probably had some great years, probably had some hits, uh, right. just a part of it. Uh, what made you decide to give up trading, which, you know, people try and walk away from it and have a very difficult time doing so? It um, is too stressful. Uh, I had a seizure once. That was enough. Okay. Uh, the doctor prescribed um, uh, medications, what, Keppra and Gabapentin. I've been taking them for years. And so uh, I don't trade anymore because um, it's it's highly stressful. I agree with you. It's great to be young and doing it, but uh, much yeah. past the age of uh, 65, um, I- I'd rather take it easy and just write. Uh, but it's a fascinating world, isn't it? Yeah. Just to it's observe a, and write it's about a jigsaw, it. It's a jigsaw puzzle. It's a... It's yeah. really, uh, you know, it's an exercise. Uh, we don't have to worry about brain fatigue like a lot of uh, people do brain exercises to keep themselves <laughs> sharp. If you're just a market watcher and analyst of the market, that's a big enough puzzle to put together, isn't it? Yeah. To keep you active. Yeah. So what uh, are you seeing here, guy? Where, what are you seeing here, John? I mean, uh, you know, I, I saw a few of your articles and, you know, I see – uh, you know, I'm the boy who cried wolf a few times this year, so I'm still seeing some pretty negative divergences. Uh, you right. know, I know that this uh, the rubber band stretched further and longer than I thought it would. I thought we'd be peaking in June, and here we are, you know, in September. Um, uh, do you think that we could be setting up for something meaningful into, you know, what is seasonally a weak period? Or are there yes. too many people looking for it? No, I, I think it's just us um, people who observe this closely uh, realize the potential for um, uh, some uh, serious selling off. I don't think um, it's widely viewed that way uh, among, uh, you know, the masses yeah. or among even people on Wall Street generally. Here's what concerns me right now. Um, and I wrote about it in the last article. It's the um, looking at the number of uh, stocks now trading above their 50-day moving average. Every week, it's lower and lower. Shrinks. We've got the phenomena of, stock, of money flowing into uh, Apple, Microsoft, yeah. and Facebook and yeah. flowing out of almost everything else. 
Um, so I keep a close eye on uh, IWM, the Russell 2000. It has not been hitting new highs. For, um, for uh, and, uh, eight months now. Yeah. Um, okay. I used to, uh, I did an LEO Wave seminar with Robert Prechter long ago in the early 90s. And uh, I don't know how much predictive value it really has, but I learned it so well. One of the great benefits was um, you analyze price charts carefully every time. Yeah. Uh, and right now, um, looking at some of the E-Wave stuff, it's gone a long way. <laughs> I don't know how long it can keep extending like this. You know, I, I, I'm i like an amateur, you know, like uh, it would be like I wouldn't call myself an astronomer if I looked through a, a telescope once. Right. But um, I, I talk to a lot of people and I know a lot of elioticians and they say that the uh, difficulty of uh, predicting the top for this wave is that it's an ending third. Right. And that's really the most powerful part of a market advance. So trying to top pick all that power can be painful if you're early. Right. Uh, so so but that but that means there's a pretty big four coming to the downside if we're peaking here yeah. and it, uh, what do you think uh what kind of correction could we get here john uh, uh, 20 to now? 30 percent uh, i would okay. say uh, okay. i'm ready for it <laughs> okay you know what else right. dale um you look for signs of excess and i think we see it in the cryptocurrency markets uh at least okay I mean, I've never seen anything like it before. Me either. Uh, What's an NFT, John? I don't even know what I can't. I can't even define it. What's an NFT? I don't know. Well, I mean, no freaking trouble. I, I, I'm not sure what it is. It's something (laughs) to speculate in if you have too much money. Okay, that is really (laughs) a sign. Yeah. Uh, How about this, John? Uh, You ever see the commercials about um, there be like a a football game going on or a big business meeting and all of a sudden someone out of place shows up in the commercial and they're like, well, who are you? And they go, well, I invest in the QQQ. Yeah. Have you seen that commercial? Sure. All yeah. right. So, you know, I mean, it's very fashionable to, you know, I, I invest in the future, the QQQ. It's like a Baron's cover to me. That's right. I think that's a sign of speculative excess I think the nuttiness uh, around the cryptocurrencies um, is another sign. It's the sort of thing you saw about uh, tech stocks in 1999 yeah. going into 2000. It's a vibe, you know? Yeah. Uh, Where do you think flight capital is going to go? The dollar? Yeah, or- I guess that's what the charts say. Uh, I like it that people have lost interest in precious metals, basically. Yeah. Uh, even though uh, on the monthly chart, it's still an uptrend. Uh, you don't hear anybody talking about it. No, um, you don't. Uh, I'm, w- I'm wondering where the money will go if the crypto starts selling off those people. Uh, yeah. Who knows? I don't know. Yeah, they're very, anti- most of them are anti-gold. It's a big debate. You see yeah. all over financial media, they'll get a gold bu- a bug and a crypto guy together and argue which is best. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I talked about last week, neither of them were. Yeah. Okay, we had down weeks in gold and, and Bitcoin. To me, it almost felt a little bit because there was no real news and it's not because the dollar was real strong, almost felt like a liquidity event to me. Yeah, no. Um, I see somebody commenting uh, in the comment section that we're boomers, Dell, and oh, it yes. happens to be true that yeah, uh, we we're, are. Sh- we're shaped by our experience. So naturally, yeah. I'm going to look at gold because that's what we looked at in the 80s, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, you know what? I feel very fortunate to be a boomer and have lived through the greatest period of music and days of trading floors and when you know you had camaraderie among traders and it was a big family instead of everyone sitting in their bedroom trying to do this how about that well i have two sons they're in their 30s one's 33 the other's 30 and they start rolling their eyes and shaking their head when i start talking about this stuff yeah i try to avoid it but I agree with you. Well, I'm glad I could give you a little outlet. You know, guys like us, uh, maybe we should have a support 
<laughs> some type of support group. But uh, you know, maybe since you are, um, you know, more of a, a journalist than I am, can you explain what this phenomena is about the banks having so much cash that the Fed has to do all these uh, reverse repos to mop it up? Do you know what's going on there, John, at all? No, I don't understand it. Um, yeah. All I look at is price charts. And um, I'm stunned to see XLF uh, yeah. and the banks in general, and even regional banks uh, continue to trend upwards. Um, although, I mean, I understand it. I see low rates uh, and, I, you know, the potential for negative rates on bonds. Uh, which is taking place, I guess, in Europe. Um, but beyond looking at price charts, no, I don't understand it. Uh, okay. I've never seen it before. All right. Well, let's switch gears to rates and yields. And, uh, uh, you know, yields have been uh, stuck. Uh, you know, I was uh, more aggressively thinking about two over 2%. And, you know, I think eventually we'll get there. And I do also think that the lows uh, are probably in, but uh, you're right. I actually talked to someone who said during World War II, we were actually at negative 13%. Is that rates. right? Wow. Yeah. yeah. So um, I think we're negative one or two. What, what's your take on bonds? I heard a quote from um, Bill Gross yesterday. You know, they're talking about his lawsuit. He plays music. Him and his neighbor aren't, aren't, <laughs> aren't getting along. I guess when you don't have you know, $20 billion bond fund to manage, you have to find something to do. So <laughs> anyway, anyway, he says that the bonds are the next um, investment is the investment garbage can. Really? Yeah, that's, mm. uh, that's Bill Gross. So I, I you know, um, I'm, I, I think that the Fed took the bond markets away from us after COVID, don't you? I agree. Um, I don't have a good feeling uh, long term here. Uh, yeah. I mean, eventually rates have to go up, don't they? Uh, or am I? I mean, they. At some I don't point, know. We're boomers, you know. We <laughs> we can't get used to you know a lot of new paradigms. I don't yeah. know if they have to. Um, uh, I you know I I think that we're due to, uh, but you know I, I thought we you know, we're due for having stock corrections before too. So, yeah. uh, so uh, uh, what, what are you looking at for maybe your next piece in uh, Forbes? Uh, what do you, maybe you'll be talking about um, um, market corrections and do you have a line in the sand for technically what would give you, you know, uh, maybe people start realizing that I'm thinking they buy the first 10% down, right? Because that, that's just a uh, uh, garden variety correction. Right. Um, and uh, and then, here's the thing, Dal. Um, uh, so many people have been trained to buy the dip these days. Yeah. Uh, not just in cryptocurrencies, uh, but it's happening in stocks. I mean, those charts you were looking at of the S&P 500, as soon as it gets back to that uptrend line, the yeah. dip buyers come in. Uh, right. I think... Um, my experience is they have to be punished uh, before they stop doing it. And uh, that's, time. Where, that, that's where we're headed. Okay. John, uh, I'm going to, I, I'm going to uh, follow you. I mean, you have this, uh, uh, <laughs> is this on a blog site or something where I could uh, get your sure. articles? I You go to, uh, well, I'm chapter 10 in the book. The, the PDF is online. Okay. Uh, although I think Matt would appreciate it if you bought the book okay. um, or go to Forbes.com and search for John Navin and you can find everything there too. John, I, I don't know about you, but I'm glad I talked into it. Nice talking to you, Dale. You know, I really enjoyed it and, uh, you know, uh, some pretty, some pretty good insights and fun to boot. And I appreciate your time. That's our most important currency nowadays, isn't it, John? Yeah, time. definitely. All right. So uh, continue to enjoy and uh, stay healthy and stress free. And I'd, I'd love to talk to you again. Let me know if you're up to it. I'll sure. We will, Dale. Thanks so much. I enjoyed it. All right. You can follow John Naven at John Naven on Twitter and uh, read his stuff. And, uh, 
you know, you're getting it through the eyes of experience. Here's what I say about experience, everyone. You can't learn it. It only comes with the passing of time and living through stuff. Okay. But you know what? You can learn from the experienced. So uh, if you want to do that, uh, join Blake and the team on the morning edge in 25 minutes. Adios, everyone. Good trading. Good luck. And we'll see everyone tomorrow. Adios. And thank you, John Navin, again. See you, Laura.